Welcome. My name is Carol Weldon. I'm a dental hygienist. I've been working in the field of veterinary dentistry for companion animals since 1981. Today we're going to be learning about complete and proper prophylaxis techniques. We're going to start with proper barrier control, instrument selection, adaptation, usage, sharpening, and we'll even talk about ergonomics. So let's get started. Proper barrier techniques. I referred to this earlier and you may be wondering why it's important and what's involved in proper barrier techniques. The use of gloves. Why are gloves important? For example, if you have a cut in your hand and you're not wearing gloves, it's a perfect opportunity for an infection as that's a portal of entry. Safety glasses or eyeglasses. For example, if a large chunk of calculus or tartar were to break off during instrumentation and fly in the eye, there would be a fulminating infection. Mask, there again, the same issue. So you're not breathing in any type of bacterial particulate. Very, very important to utilize this equipment during the course of a proper prophylaxis technique. Just what does ergonomics mean? Ergonomics means the use of proper body positioning and alignment during the course of the prophylaxis procedure. That entails your feet planted firmly on the ground, your back in a straight and upright position, and your arms at a 90 degree angle during instrumentation. Why is this so important? Because over a period of time, Let's say you're performing seven, eight, or nine prophylaxis procedures a day. Over time, this will lead to body fatigue and shorten your lifespan as an operator. As we begin our prophylaxis procedure, we utilize what's called a proper instrument grasp. And what I mean by proper instrument grasp is grasping the instrument and employing what we call the triangle of forces. The triangle of forces incorporates the thumb, the index, and the middle finger. And as you can see, that forms a triangle. That, along with the ring finger, which acts as a fulcrum on the tooth surface when you're performing your working strokes, provides all of the power. The power in performing a proper working stroke then avoids what we call finger scaling. Finger scaling can result in ineffective stroke pattern and lead to operator fatigue. The mouth mirror enables us to see in difficult areas. We can walk the mouth mirror throughout the mouth we can utilize the mouth mirror for cheek retraction, and importantly, the mouth mirror provides an ergonomic function. The number four mirror can be used for large breed canines. The number three mirror is suitable for small canine mouths and felines. The periodontal probe is used to assess the severity of periodontal disease and it's graduated in markings anywhere from one millimeter to 18 millimeters, color-coded and etched. It's held parallel to the long axis of the tooth, inserted to the base of the pocket very carefully until you meet what's called a spongy resistance. This is the junctional epithelium. At that point, it is carefully walked around the junctional epithelium to the base, or what we call the sulcus, from not only the buccal standpoint, but the lingual standpoint, and periodontal probe readings are recorded at various intervals. The periodontal probe is a diagnostic instrument, and it is the next step in the periodontal process. One needs to be careful not to puncture the junctional epithelium, because while in human dentistry, 
your patients can say, ouch, with an animal under general anesthesia, we don't know if we're being too heavy handed and if we punctured the junctional epithelium, that can lead to prolonged healing time. The shepherd's hook explorer is a very thin, delicate instrument. The reason being this is a thin, delicate instrument is it enables the operator to feel any surface irregularities, carious lesions, or calculus deposits by having the vibration transmitted up to the fingertips. This instrument can be used either supragingively or subgingively, inserting into the base of the pocket or anywhere along the root surface, feeling for these irregularities. In addition to that, it can be used in the areas between multi-rooted teeth, whether they be two or three root teeth, to determine if there's the disease process that has advanced into what we call furcation involvement. Again, a very delicate instrument that will feel any irregularities. And in addition to that, this instrument is also very effective for detecting cervical line lesions in the feline mouth. The next step involves the use of our scaler. The scaler is a working instrument that employs the triangle of forces, that being the thumb, the index, and the middle finger, along with the ring finger, which acts as a fulcrum. Notice that the scaler has two parallel cutting edges. That's very important to be aware of because the scaler is to be used above the gum line only. If you were to insert this below the gum line, it would lacerate the gingiva. One end incorporates what's called an anterior jacket. The anterior jacket can be placed interproximally in the anterior region, both the mandible and the maxilla, operating the instrument with a rocking wrist motion. Again, note, all of the power is derived by rocking the wrist with the ring finger. The opposite end is a sickle, and while the sickle can be used in the anterior region, it is more suited interproximally as one goes back toward the distal portion or posterior in the mouth. Again, very important to employ the triangle of forces with the rocking wrist motion and keeping the instrument above the gum line. Another scaler that can be used in the working group of instruments is known as the Morse 0-00. This is a very tiny bladed instrument with two parallel cutting edges. So again, this instrument is to be used above the gum line only to prevent laceration of the gingiva. This does an excellent job in stain removal on the maxillary canine tooth of not only the canine, but the feline mouth. Notice the rocking wrist motion and notice the orientation of the blade in removing the stain in that vertical groove. Curettes are also a member of the working class. The curette is different from the scaler in that it has a rounded back, a football shaped toe, and one cutting edge. The fact that there's a rounded back on the curette allows for subgingival or up into the gum line insertion and it will not lacerate the gingiva. This is a universal curette known as a Columbia 1314. Universal means that it can be used anywhere throughout the mouth. When we insert the instrument, notice I'm using the proper working stroke. We go up into the gum line, open out to engage the cutting edge at a 70 degree angle and perform a pull in an oblique fashion stroke. Notice the rocking wrist motion. This enables us then to remove large and small deposits of calculus to remove any surface irregularities or rough cementum. This particular instrument is useful not only for large and small breed canines,
but it's an ideal instrument for the use with felines in that it has a shorter shank length than some of the other curettes that are currently available. The Barnhart 1-2 is also a curette and a working instrument. The Barnhart 1-2 differs from the Columbia 1314 in that it has a longer terminal shank. This makes the instrument ideal for insertion and adaptation with the larger breeds on the carnasal tooth and the canine tooth. The longer terminal shank, depicted here, provides proper instrumentation not only from an insertion, adaptation, and pull stroke standpoint, but it'll cover a broader base with these larger teeth. Proper equipment care and maintenance incorporates determining whether or not an instrument is dull or an instrument is sharp. The greatest reason for instrument loss is due not only to dropping an instrument and breaking it, but either incorrectly sharpening it or over sharpening it. Your working instruments, scalers and curettes, should be sharpened prior to the prophylaxis procedure. We utilize what's called an acrylic test stick to determine whether or not an instrument is sharp or is dull. Many years ago, we used to use fingernails. This is no longer an accepted way to determine dullness or sharpness of an instrument. The scalers and curettes will be tested utilizing the test stick and dragging the instrument tip down the test stick. If it grabs as it does here and flashing is created, then the instrument is sharp and it doesn't need to be sharpened. With the curette, making certain to do the cutting edge on the undersurface, notice how it doesn't grab and no flashing is generated. This instrument is dull. Once you've determined which instruments are dull and need to be sharpened, you reach for your number four Arkansas stone, your can of sharpening oil, placing one or two drops on the stone, wiping lightly to smooth in the oil with the cloth, and then you can proceed to sharpening. Place the dull instrument to be sharpened perpendicular against the table with the face of the blade facing towards you. Grab the number four Arkansas flat stone, place it flat against the blade, opening it out to a 70 to 90 degree angle to maintain the internal bevel, two down strokes. Turn it to the other side and two down strokes. Repeat the performance on the other side with the anterior jacket, placing it flush against the blade, opening it out 70 to 90 to maintain the internal bevel, two down strokes. Then the other side of the parallel blade, two down strokes. You've now finished sharpening your scaler. To sharpen your curette, will be similar, but we'll also need to place emphasis on the rounded toe. Holding the instrument in such a way perpendicular to the table, but you have to have the toe facing towards you. Again, orienting the blade in such a way that the stone engages it, opening it out 70 to 90 degree angle, two down strokes, and walking it around the toe with two down strokes to round the football shaped blade. Flipping the instrument again, placing it so the toe or the face of the blade is facing upward, engaging the stone against the cutting edge, opening it out 70 to 90 degrees, two down strokes, and walking it around the rounded football toe with two down strokes as you round it.
The final step in the sharpening procedure utilizes a conical stone. Notice how I have the blade oriented upward facing me. I hold the conical stone in one hand and I merely give a flick of the wrist twice. What that does is that removes the flashing and removes any irregularities from the toe of the blade. On occasion, you'll need to sharpen your Explorer, which is one of your diagnostic instruments. This can be accomplished by placing one drop of oil on your sharpening stone, two very, very light strokes on one side, flip the instrument over, and two very light strokes on the other. And you're finished. Now that you've learned about proper instrument selection and usage, it's equally important to learn about proper sterilization methods. Whether you use chemclave, autoclave, it's just as effective to learn how to utilize a system where you can not only protect your instruments, organize your instruments, and effectively sterilize them. One such method is through the use of a cassette. Well, we've covered a lot of information today, haven't we? Let's review barrier technique, important for the prevention of disease transmission. Ergonomics, proper body position to prevent fatigue. Instrument grasp and adaptation, using triangle of forces, effective instrumentation. Why do we select the instruments that we do? in order to provide a complete and thorough prophylaxis procedure. How to sharpen, very, very important to maintain the life of your instruments. And sterilization, very important again for the prevention of disease transmission. My goal is for you to go back to your practice and be able to provide the best level of care that you can for your patients. I'm Carol Weldon and thank you for joining me. For additional information about the Weldon Periodontal Kit, to place an order, or for an in-office demonstration, contact Miltex at 1-866-854-8300 or your local authorized Miltex distributor.